So let's turn to John chapter 12 as we approach the familiar story of uh, Palm Sunday. Uh, but right before we get into that, just an important note, we will not have a study on Easter, which is a week from today. Um, the reason for that is that, well, there's two reasons. One is that uh, many of you will be involved in special services that other churches and um, there's a lot of uh, special concerts and such that are going on uh, around various towns that you may want to take advantage of. Um, but also um, I will be, um, Kathy will be flying home on uh, Easter, flying from Southern California to Cincinnati and the dog tank and I will be beginning our drive home. It'll take us three or four days to get there. So um, it just happens that we have to vacate on Easter Sunday because it's the last day of the month and the new camp hosts are coming in. So I uh, won't see you next week, but I do, of course, wish you a, a glorious Easter and uh, a reminder that Jesus Christ is king forever and ever and amen. Um I have a concern, and uh, I was thinking about this as I was studying um, the passages about Palm Sunday, um, and I, and I maybe hopefully you'll see how my concern ties in with Palm Sunday in in a few minutes. But uh, my concern is that evil uh, has been rising all around us, um, not just in this country, but around the world. Uh, Anti-immigration uh, sentiment is at an all-time high. Um, people, uh, there, there's a, a law. It's not, it's not been uh, signed into law yet, but there's a pending law in the legislature in Arizona right now that makes it that would make it legal to shoot and kill um, undocumented immigrants if they are trespassing on your land, <clears throat> and. Uh, Southern Arizona is uh, has some huge ranches, and of course, um, <coughs> um, people that are coming in across the Mexican border often uh, could walk across, you know, some of that property without even knowing that they're trespassing, and they could wind up being killed by vigilantes. There's a guy on trial right now for doing exactly that, um, and. Uh, I, I'm told he most likely will be acquitted. Um, there's been uh, nationwide uh, in this country uh, a huge backlash against ba Black Lives Matter. Uh, there's a huge backlash against um, LGBTQ people um, and some of the advances that have recently been made um, and a desire to take away uh, some of those advances. White nationalism is on the rise. Militarism is on the rise. Anti-democratic uh, candidates are increasingly popular. Um, dictators, autocratic strongmen are coming into power um, at various countries around the world. Um, as far as back here in the United States, uh, we are a country that's flooded with guns, and inundated with lies. And as wise people have often said, if you tell a lie enough times, um, it, uh, people eventually believe that it's true. And uh, globally, uh, we're right on the brink of environmental and economic collapse. Um, so uh, and I could go on, um, but I, I have this concern for the future of this nation, I have a concern for the future of uh, humankind uh, in general. And so what does that have to do with Palm Sunday? <laughs> um, well, first of all, let's, let's read John's version of what happened. Uh, the next day, which would have been Sunday, the Sunday before Jesus was crucified, uh, a week before he rose again from the dead, the next day, the great crowd that had come to the festival, this is the festival of Passover, 
uh, Jerusalem was packed with pilgrims uh, during this week. Um, some, some perhaps as many as two million uh, people who did not live full time in Jerusalem had journeyed to Jerusalem or were journeying to Jerusalem um, to celebrate the feast of Passover. So the next day, the great crowd that had come to the festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Um, when in those days, in biblical times, when a great person, like, for example, the emperor of Rome, uh, was coming into a city or into a town, um, the uh, people of the town, especially the wealthy people, the people of prominence uh, would, um, but generally they would gather as many people as the, everybody that was, that possibly could, would uh, go out in uh, to meet the important person and then to escort them back into the town. Um, that, by the way, is what um, that passage in First Thessalonians 4 is all about when it says the Lord himself will descend uh, with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first, and we who are alive and remain will be caught up in the air to meet him. It's, it's God's people going to greet Jesus as he comes the second time and escort him uh, in triumph uh, to the earth to establish his kingdom. That's what these people are doing here. They, they believe that he's the Messiah, they're going forth to meet him in order to escort him to his throne. Um, they have a mistaken idea as to what's going to happen and what that throne is about. Uh, but that's what's in their hearts. So they go forth, they take branches of palm trees, uh, and they go out to meet him shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. It says that Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it. We're given more details about how he got the donkey and the other gospels. Um, as it is written, do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. That's a quote from Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. His disciples did not understand these things at first, John tells us. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written of him uh, and had been done to him. Um, this event was predicted long before it happened. Way back in the book of Psalms, um, in Psalm 118, which was probably, uh, no one knows when Psalm 18 was written, but it was probably um, 900 or 1,000 years before the birth of Jesus. And the psalm predicted that this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Um, we often quote that verse as if it was meant to apply to every day. And there's nothing wrong with that. It does apply to every day. Every day is a day that the Lord made. And every day is a day that we should rejoice and be glad in. But in context, in Psalm 118, it's talking about a specific day. It's talking about Palm Sunday. It's a prediction of Palm Sunday. Um, and, of course, as I said, uh, uh, there was a quote there from Zechariah 9.9, which says, uh, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And then, uh, just to keep that into context, uh, the next verse says, He will cut off the chariot from Ephraim, which is another name for the northern part of Israel, and the war horse from Jerusalem. And the battle bow shall be cut off. He shall command peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river. And in context, it's talking about the Euphrates River to the ends of the earth. Now, so the, the prediction in the book of Psalms uh, dates back perhaps a thousand years before the birth of Jesus. Um, this prediction dates back 
uh, around three or 400 years before the birth of Jesus. Uh, it is a post-exilic prediction. That is, um, the uh, Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian army uh, have destroyed the city of Jerusalem, destroyed the temple. They did so in 587 BC. They carried away uh, most of the people, except for some of the very poor. And between 50 and 70 years later, uh, after Babylon had been conquered by Medo-Persia, uh, the people were allowed to begin to come back. And there was this expectation among them, um, a strong expectation that Messiah was going to come and throw off the yoke of uh, Medo-Persia. And then later Medo-Persia was conquered by Greece. Uh, but the expectation that that the yoke of Greece was going to be thrown off by Messiah uh, carried over. And it's carried over now that Rome has conquered everybody and they are under the oppression of Rome. So the people are expecting the Messiah and they're expecting the Messiah to set them free. Uh, that proclamation in Zechariah 9.9 is an anti-imperial proclamation. And you may have noticed that um, in Zechariah, it begins with rejoice greatly. When John quotes it, uh, it changes to don't be afraid. Be, rejoice greatly because Messiah is coming. Uh, John changes it to don't be afraid because Messiah is coming. Um, th there's no contradiction there. We rejoice greatly. Uh, I mean, we're, we don't have to be afraid because uh, Messiah is coming and we rejoice greatly. In order to rejoice greatly, we need to be free of our fears. Um, in Zechariah, it says your king is coming to you humble and riding on a donkey. And that, that word humble in Zechariah 9 uh, refers often in the New Testament to impoverished socially vulnerable people. So right away from that quotation in Zechariah chapter 9, we know that the messianic king who's predicted to come is associated with the poor and the oppressed. And of course, that describes Jesus. That's who he hung out with. That's who he spent his time with. Uh, he is the one who began his ministry by saying, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to preach good news to the poor. And as I've often thought and said, uh, if it's not good news to the poor, it's not the gospel of Jesus. Uh, that phrase, good news, or sometimes translated gospel, um, is, is shorthand to, to summarize all of the teaching of Jesus. Uh, sometimes people have tried to reduce the gospel to... Um, um, a, a person who doesn't know Christ, accepting Christ as his or her Lord and Savior. And, and that's obviously very, very important. But the good news is broader than that. The good news includes everything Jesus said, um, at least everything that Jesus, well, everything Jesus said. But what we know of what Jesus said is what's recorded in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Um so the things that Jesus taught us, that's the good news. That's the gospel. And he came to bring good news uh, to all humankind, but most especially to the poor. So now coming back to the Palm Sunday story, um, what we know historically is that there were two entrances, two processions coming into the city of Jerusalem approximately at the same time. From the west, Pilate was coming into Jerusalem uh, on his great war steed with great pomp, with great show of military force, with soldiers all around him and uh, all that stuff. And he was coming to uh, stay in the Antonio Fortress, which was built right next to the temple in the city of Jerusalem. And he's coming because it's the Feast of Passover and because all these pilgrims have come from all over the Roman Empire to be in Jerusalem. He's not coming to worship, of course. He's coming 
to keep an eye on all these people. If there's any trouble, he's going to squash it immediately. Uh, so in the, from the west, uh, on the west side of the city, there's this great um, procession, Roman procession coming in, uh, all this hoopla and pomp and show of military force and uh, designed to, to strike fear into the hearts of all these pilgrims. Just the procession itself would have communicated to all the Jewish pilgrims, uh, hey, you know, out, out of the goodness of our hearts, we're allowing you to be here to do your Passover thing, but uh, don't step out of line because because we'll kill you. You know, um, it's, it's uh, designed to strike fear into the heart of the uh, hearts of the oppressed. At the same time, on the eastern side of the city, Jesus is riding in on a donkey surrounded by unarmed peasants who are waving palm branches. Uh, look at the stark contrast between those two processions, one coming from the west, one coming from the east. One is a show of, of, of might and power and wealth and oppression. The other, um, uh, to, to a Roman soldier, would look like a joke. The one coming from the east you know, if, if you're a Roman soldier steeped in, you know, Roman militarism, you think uh, this this ragtag group of ne'er-do-wells and, and some peasant guy from up north riding on a donkey of all things, um, and they're shouting, they're waving palm branches around. You probably, if you were a Roman soldier, uh, you would have scoffed at it. You would have laughed at it. You would have thought, yeah, you know. Uh, who do these people think they are? If you're a Jew, you're expecting a Messiah, your Messiah, to ride into the city of Jerusalem, to ride into the eastern gate. You're expecting him to go to the Antonio Palace, where Pilate is is um, just recently, you know, moved in. Pilate normally lived in Caesarea, which is on the Mediterranean coast. Um, that's where his main palace was. But during feasts, he would switch over to the Antonio Fortress. Um, so you're expecting the Messiah to, to enter into the city and to go to the An Antonio Palace and to set up his kingdom. You're waving palms if you're a, a, a Jew welcoming Messiah. It's a symbol of Messiah coming to deliver you and your people from the oppression of Rome, just just like the uh, Judas Maccabees and his brothers did 175 years before. Uh, that was the oppression of, of the Seleucian Empire. But um, you're, you're expecting that kind of thing. Um, you're expecting Jesus to go to the Antonio Fortress. You're expecting him to, to rile up a crowd of people. And you're expecting him to use his miraculous powers to help destroy Roman occupation. What you're expecting is Jesus to get everybody fired up. And now they all go charging out, you know, with their swords and spears and stuff. Of course, Rome is much more powerful. But then, but you've got this Messiah who, yeah, you know, the wind and waves obey him. He can make the earth open up and swallow up the Roman army. Um, you're expecting a war where God is fighting for you on your side and using uh, miracles to do so. That's, that's what you're expecting. Instead, Jesus goes to the temple. He does not go to the Antonio Fortress. He goes to the temple and he doesn't do anything. He looks around and then he goes back out of the city. The next day, he rides back into the city um, and um, puts on a bit of prophetic theater. Uh, first, he curses a, a, a fig tree, which is a symbol of national Israel. And then he goes down to the temple and he knocks over the tables and uh, cracks a whip. He doesn't take a whip to any person. He cracks a whip to uh, startle the animals that were scheduled to be sacrificed and drive them away. He creates chaos. Uh, we call that the cleansing of the temple, but it's really not. Uh, he didn't cleanse the temple. What he did was he shut it down. 
How long did he shut it down for? Well, at least a few hours, however long it took for them to set their tables back up and scoop up their coins from the ground and uh, find the animals that had run off and bring them back. It wasn't a permanent shutdown, but it was a, a, a bit of a prophetic theater, just like Jeremiah used um, when he blocked the entrance of the temple um, to keep people from going into worship. Um, that's what Jesus is doing here. He's identifying himself with Jeremiah. They all knew that story. He's shutting down the temple. He's disrupting the temple in an act of civil disobedience um, in, in order to display how God feels about the temple. But on Palm Sunday, he simply goes in to the temple, looks around, and then goes back uh, the way he came, up on the Mount of Olives, uh, over to the other side, spends the night. He does that repeatedly throughout Holy Week. So, sticking with Palm Sunday, well, what, is, what is the meaning of that? Well, I think we begin to understand the meaning if we can jump forward to Friday of Holy Week. Uh, in the morning of Friday of Holy Week, Jesus now has been arrested by the Sanhedrin Council, uh, brought before the Sanhedrin Council illegally, condemned to death, but they're not allowed to, uh, the Jews are not allowed to put anybody to death. So um, he is then taken by the Jewish leaders to Pilate, who has the authority of life and death, uh, in order, uh, to, and then going to try to convince him, and ultimately do convince him, to crucify Jesus. So Friday morning, Jesus is standing before Pilate. And he says to Pilate, my kingdom does not belong to this world. If my kingdom belonged to this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate said, so you're a king? And Jesus said, you say that I'm a king. For this, I was born. In other words, yes, I was born to be a king. And for this, I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, what is truth? So this procession on Palm Sunday is Jesus ushering in his kingdom. This is the king coming to institute a brand new kind of kingdom which doesn't belong to this world. It's not of this world. It doesn't belong to the world, but it is in this world. Jesus is not here talking about some kingdom that's off in some distant heaven, someplace in the sweet by and by. He's not talking about an immaterial kingdom. He's not talking about an escapist kingdom where, you know, we, we're, we're in a mess here. All these things are going badly for us, so get us out of here. He's talking about a kingdom that is real. It's here on earth but it's different than any other kingdom or any other empire on this earth. This kingdom, this kingdom of God, is subversive. It subverts all the violence and control of all the worldly kingdoms. This kingdom is filled with sacrificial, cruciform love. This kingdom is noted for its sacrificial and cruciform love. Worldly kingdoms are noted for their material wealth, noted for their powerful militaries, noted for their influence around the world, noted for, um, you know, bo booming economies and that sort of thing. But the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, those phrases are interchangeable, is noted for its sacrificial cross-shaped love. This kingdom looks like Jesus riding on a donkey and hanging on a cross for the sins of the world. That's what he's getting across as he rides in on Palm Sunday and the people are shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, by the way, means save now. Save now, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. But 
but they're not thinking about save us from our sins so we can go to some faraway heaven someday. What they're thinking when they shout save now is deliver us from Rome, save us from this oppression. We have been under the oppression of violent pagan empires for 600 years. Uh, set us free, deliver us from this oppression. That's what they're crying out for. And as I said, they're expecting, and they're excited, they're full of joy. They're expecting Jesus to, to get through the gate and turn towards the Antonio Palace and get this thing on the road. Instead, he goes, looks at the temple, and leaves. And then, and then, comes in the next day and then he comes in you know um, on uh, uh, other days during the week as well um, uh, he's teaching them by example that his kingdom is different that this empire that God is establishing is different than any other empire the empires of the world look like Pilate riding on a war steed the kingdom of God looks like Jesus riding on a donkey, dressed in a, a in, in a peasant's robe. It, it, it was the only thing that he owned. And the Bible says that it, it was woven without seam. So it was woven on a on a circular hoop um, so, so around, you know, so that so that there were no seams in it. I, I wonder who made that robe for him. I'm guessing it was probably his mother, Mary. Um, it was the only thing uh, that he owned. <laughs> well, that in his sandals, I guess. Um, that's what the kingdom of God looks like. The, the kingdoms of this world look like spears and swords and power and control. This kingdom looks like Jesus hanging on a cross. This kingdom, the kingdom of God, is always nonviolent. It's always non-coercive. It always is characterized by serving, by giving, by sacrificing. This kingdom, the kingdom of God, slays lies with truth. It conquers hatred with love. This kingdom, the kingdom of God, is always on the side of peace. It always stands with those who are oppressed. He's humble. He's identifying with those who are oppressed and marginalized. He's taking the side of the poor. Worldly empires always use power over others rather than power under others. Worldly empires always use law and violence to coerce people, control people, and to suppress opposition. God's kingdom never does those things. Moreover, I think we need to be reminded that all empires are satanic. Now, when I say that, I don't mean that everything in the empire is bad. Because Satan is much more subtle than that. Satan comes as an angel of light. And you, you take any empire in history, whether whether it's um, the ancient Egyptian empire or uh, the Babylonians, uh, the, the Medo-Persians, uh, Greece, Rome, uh, the British Empire, the empire of America today. Uh, there's a lot of good things in those empires. Uh, we're in the time of Rome here, and and Rome did some great things. They had they had uh, they they built. Um, passable roads all, all over Europe and Asia and Africa so that goods could flow from one to another. That brought prosperity to, to millions and millions of people. Um, they, they developed um, aqueduct systems that brought water to places that didn't have water before. And, you know, so we could go on. It's, it's not that we're saying when I say all oh, empires are satanic, I don't mean that they're, everything that they do is terrible and horrible. And, and um, you know, because when you say that, people go, oh, well, how come you, you, you hate America? I don't hate America. I love America. Um, I just love God more. Um, 
but every empire, including the American empire, is deep underneath being manipulated by satanic forces. We know that from Matthew chapter 4, um, where Jesus was tempted, uh, especially in the temptation when it says that the devil took Jesus to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world, all of them, all of them, past, you know, present, future, all the kingdoms of the Lord, and showed them all their glory, you know, all their might and their power and their wealth and all that stuff. And Satan said to Jesus, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. And notice that Jesus did not say, well, you, you can't give those to me because you don't own them. He acknowledged that Satan could give them to him. But of course, Jesus refused to take them that way. He said, away from me, away with you, Satan, for it's written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. That's a quotation from Deuteronomy chapter 6. So no matter how beautiful the empire looks, and no matter how good, no matter how many good things the empire is doing, remember that worldly empires are fundamentally different than the kingdom of God. So how do we respond to that? Well, first of all, we want to make sure that we don't fall asleep. <laughs> Secondly, we want to make sure that we don't give in to despair, that we recognize that God is in control. Yes, there's a lot of things that are going wrong in the world. Uh, I started out by mentioning some of those things. Uh, environmental, we're right on the brink of environmental disaster. Um, Anti-immigration sentiment and uh, racism and uh, homophobia and uh, the rise of dictators and so forth and so on. There's so much um, that's that's clearly not of God. Um, but uh, don't let that get you down. Don't despair. God is in control. God is on his throne. And the devil is not going to win. Don't fall into the temptation of turning to the power of the sword or the power of the law, that's not the way of God. The weapons of our warfare are not merely human. They have divine power to destroy strongholds. And we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against uh, every, uh, against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. So don't put your trust in any earthly political savior or any earthly political party or any earthly candidate or slogan and and don't try to reach for power or control um people people ask me you know are you are you democrat or are you republican uh, i don't follow the elephant and i don't follow the donkey i follow the lamb it's all about the lamb of god i'm a citizen of the kingdom of heaven yes i live in the united states i try to be a good citizen of the united states I exercise my right to vote. Um, I, I, I try to um, vote for the people that are uh, the godliest or the least ungodly, as the case may be. Um, but, um, but my faith and trust isn't in that. Um, it's that my faith and trust is in Jesus. Um, I'm, I'm not thinking that this political party or that political party is going to, um, you know, uh, straighten things out. I'm thinking that Jesus is the one that's going to straighten out the world. Um, we are called to trust in the king's cruciform way. And it seems absurd, but we are called to pledge our allegiance to Jesus, the crucified and risen Christ not to anyone or anything else. And uh, I didn't write this, but uh, I, I'm paraphrasing something that I read. I couldn't couldn't find the exact quote. But anyway, essentially what it said was, with Jesus, we shall overcome, crushing the head of the serpent with feet fit with readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. You know, that comes from 
uh, the description of the whole armor of God, your feet shod with the gospel of peace. Our feet fit with readiness that comes from the gospel of peace, the, the king's way, the good news. It's good news to the poor. It's good news. So we are called as followers of Jesus to remain faithful to our baptismal profession. Uh, it's probably a good idea in whatever, whatever um, um, Christian tradition you were baptized in. Uh, it's probably a good idea to go back um, maybe regularly and reread that, that baptismal ceremony, you know? Um, it's, if you're associated with any denomination, it's, it's, it's available to you. Um, and, and you can, you know, read that and, and see what the profession was all about. Uh, each time we share in Holy Communion, we're remembering the truth that death is the path to life and that the greatest in the kingdom is the servant of all. We're reminded that the, in this kingdom, in God's kingdom, this kingdom that Jesus was proclaiming when he rode into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey on that original Palm Sunday, in this kingdom, the way up is down, the greatest is the servant of all. In this kingdom, darkness is defeated by light. In this kingdom, lies are defeated by truth. In this kingdom, hatred is defeated by love. We don't meet hatred with hatred. We, we don't meet lies with more lies. We don't try to fight violence with more violence. We take our stand with the king of kings knowing that if we do that, it could result in our death. So what? <laughs> to be martyred is the greatest of honors, to be carried into the presence of God by the way of the cross. Not that we seek after that. We are followers of Jesus. Jesus is king of kings, Jesus is Lord of Lords. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. And the very last thing he says to the church in Revelation is, surely I am coming quickly. And the last cry of the church, the last prayer of the church, the last response of the church recorded in the Bible is, amen, even so, come Lord Jesus. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. I don't know when Jesus is going to come back again. I'm not trying to predict anything. Uh, but my goodness, when you look around and see the rise of these dictators, and when you see the rise of this anti-immigration sentiment, and when you see the rise of racism that you thought we had dealt with decades ago, and, and when you see the rise of militarism and hatred and uh, threats and um, and when you you see when you really study and see what we as human beings have done to the planet on which we live and um, you know some scientists believe we're already beyond the tipping point that there's no going back but when you see all that um, it, it just leaves you with with uh, an understanding that wow may, maybe Maybe Jesus is coming back real soon. Um, and regardless, uh, we need to be ready. We need to live each and every day so we'd be proud to stand before him that night. And if he gives us tomorrow, let's live tomorrow so we'd be happy to stand before him tomorrow night. Let's live full on for Jesus. Let's live cruciform lives filled with love filled with mercy, filled with grace, responding to evil with good, responding to hatred with love, uh, responding to op oppression by serving the poor and the needy and identifying ourselves with the marginalized. That, I think, for me at least, this year is the message of Palm Sunday. And so, Father, I ask in Jesus' name that you would 
so touch our hearts that we would be fully aligned with you, that we would um, not just shout Hosanna, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord, but that we would see clearly how it is that you are overthrowing evil, how it is that you are setting up your kingdom, how this kingdom of yours subverts all other kingdoms, how this kingdom of yours is an upside down kingdom, how it responds to violence with love, with to uh, hatred with forgiveness, it responds to needs with service. Father, we give our lives to you afresh and anew this holy Easter season. We surrender to you, and all we want, Lord, is to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to leave you with uh, a couple of quotes that you can um, think about. I don't expect you to remember these. Uh, for those of you that are uh, able to stay with us and in, in our little breakout groups in just a moment, uh, I will copy this and, and put it in, uh, in the chat uh, so that you can reference it. Um, but I'm wondering, uh, do you agree or, or not? And, and either way is fine. Um, and but you know why do you agree or why do you disagree um, with these two statements? The first one is rather than maintaining an inequitable peace, you know, a society where it's peaceful but it's really uh, there's a whole group of people that are oppressed. Uh, rather than maintaining that, followers of Jesus are called to challenge unjust power structures. Um, you think that's true or not? And and if it is true, um, how how would you go about challenging those unjust power structures? And the second statement: um, many Anabaptist believers uh, refuse to pledge allegiance to any flag. Uh, they also refuse to kill others for any reason whatsoever. Um, do, you, do you agree or disagree with that, or part of it? Um, and if if so, why? So uh, I will drop those in the chat, and uh, you can think about that, and we'll get back together. And um, what time is it? About ten minutes, I think.